the doctor took a patient into the room and said, I have some good news and some bad news. The patient said, give me the good news. The doctor replied, they're going to name a disease after you. Now, the reason I told you this little dumb joke is, according to a 2013 study published in Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin, most people with good and bad news to share prefer to share the good news first. The researchers call it priming emotion protection. It's just a fancy way of saying, well, maybe this won't suck so bad if I ease into it. <laughs> now, for us Christians, though, the good news is the gospel. I'm sure a lot of you all already know what the word gospel means. It basically means good news. Very simple, huh? Very, very simple. But you know, it's religion that complicates it. And that's been going on a really long time, ever since 2,000 years ago. Actually, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 3, <clears throat> Foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? You know, really, the gospel is so simple that you actually need help to not understand it. Now, what's happening here with the Galatians is there's a lot of Jewish converts that were trying to apply God's law and ordinance to God's grace. You can't marry those two together. It doesn't work. And so the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians to straighten them up. Now in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. For as many as, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now these scriptures make it pretty clear that we're not justified by the law. And I'm not talking about just the Ten Commandments. There's over 600 ordinances in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus that we're supposed to keep. And uh, here's the thing. If you even broke one of those laws, you are guilty of breaking them all. And incidentally, the word justified, you ever heard that? Are we justified? Here's an easy way to remember this, and I tell this mainly for the kids because big words kind of confuse them. The word justified in a biblical sense means just if I'd never sinned. That's a simple way to remember. That's kind of simple, isn't it? Simple gospel, right? But then again, religion has made something very simple, hard to understand. Religion basically preaches and teaches another gospel. Like it says in Galatians, chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. Again, this is Paul writing to these Galatians. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto them than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Notice that part says, even an angel from heaven preach another gospel. Does that sound kind of familiar? Ever heard of Mormons? How about Jehovah's Witnesses? You know, there's even some Pentecostal denominations, particularly United Pentecostals. They still tell you that we're supposed to keep some of those Old Testament ordinances, like uh, the women. You're not allowed to cut your hair. You're not allowed to wear makeup either. Or wear jewelry even. Because, oh, that's Old Testament law stuff. You know, it's funny. I've been to churches like that, that believe that. And it's funny that, well, the women didn't wear makeup or wear jewelry or cut their hair. But you know what they did do? They wore some of the most elaborate dresses you have ever seen in your life. And it's funny. They had four foot long hair all rolled up in a bun. Kind of looked like short hair anyway, didn't it? Uh, some churches just have some weird customs. Like uh, no instruments in worship. Church of Christ. <laughs> now, some churches are just plain wacko. Like those who like to handle poisonous snakes and to prove that they have faith. What they're doing is they're tempting God. And now that's something God told us we're not supposed to do. Oh, and what about those churches that pray to Mary and to angels and to saints? Catholics? Mm -hmm. They have confessions to their priest and they call their priest father. Now that's something else the Lord said we're not supposed to do, huh? Now even some mainstream denominations preach that uh, the gifts of the Spirit passed away with the apostles. And, and also a once saved, always saved. I think you get the point. The simple gospel has been made hard to understand with these religious people. They're basically man-made traditions, a lot of them, and doctrines. They are, in fact, frustrating the grace of God. Like it says in Galatians 2.16, <clears throat> again, Paul is writing to the Galatians, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, notice verse 16. The faith of Jesus the faith of Christ. This is actually part of that makes the gospel so simple. We're not saved by observing laws and ordinances or by being good. We're saved by the faith of Jesus. It doesn't say in Jesus, does it? It says of Jesus. It's his faith that gets us saved, and we have to believe in that. It's by Jesus' faith that we receive grace. Or undeserved favor is a good way of explaining that. Like it says in Acts chapter 20, verses 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, 
so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And like I said, grace basically means undeserved favor. You know, we all do deserve hell. But through Jesus' blood, we receive grace. That's pretty simple to understand, right? But again, religion makes things complicated. Actually, Paul explains the simple gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, it doesn't get any more simpler than this, does it, folks? So why does religion insist on all the rules of do's and don'ts? You know why? They want to control you like a schoolmaster, as it says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, if these religions were doing what they're supposed to do, Actually, that would be all right, but most of them don't. It's like the Bible says uh, what true religion is in James 1, 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, I really can't think of any pure religion that's going on today that's undefiled, really. And besides, Christianity really isn't a religion anyway. Did you know that? It's a personal relationship with God. And in that personal relationship with God, we of our own free will, we want to do good works for God. Not in order to earn anything, though. Well, other than maybe crowns in heaven. Now, those good works that we do are actually the fruit of the Spirit. The simple gospel is also something we are commanded to share with others. Are you all prepared to do that? Do you know how to witness for God? Or are you maybe a little bit unsure of yourself? Well, if you are, you better read 2 Timothy 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, sometimes when you witness to a lost person, um, they'll try to throw you off track sometimes with weird questions like, oh, okay, but where did God come from? Now, the response to a question like that, actually 2 Timothy 2, 23 kind of gives us an idea, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Now, a lot of people that are lost that reply with questions like that, you're better off just walking away from them because, you know, all they really want to do is start a fight with you. So when you're witnessing somebody and they start asking you dumb questions, just walk away. But now, if they start asking you legitimate questions like, well, how do you know we're born with a sin nature? Again, second Timothy, be prepared to give them an answer. Explain to them. Start with Adam and Eve if you want to, and then the fall of man, and go through Moses and the law leading up to Jesus and the cross if you want to. But remember, try to keep it as simple as possible. Now, I'm going to give you an example of this. <clears throat> Back in 1983, quite a long time ago, wasn't it? I was going to this church that... Uh, they had some visiting ministry that came in, and um, 
What it was, it was this fellow came in, he was teaching people how to be an effective witness when you're witnessing the gospel. That's where I got the idea, really, to keep it simple. And, um, you know, that's something really, churches don't really teach that much anymore, how to witness, I mean. Anyway, at this time, during 1983, I was uh, also working in this window factory. It was an assembly line. It was those vinyl double pane windows, you know, the kind of tilt in for easy cleaning. You know, you've seen those advertised. I actually worked in a plant like that for eight years. And anyway, after I heard this guy that was teaching how to witness, he got me all fired up. And so we had about 50 employees. I witnessed every single one of them. Man, I was on fire. I just had to. I, I, if I didn't, I felt bad. Now, some of them actually did avoid me, probably because I, they had some conviction. And some of them would pretend to listen. And I did this for over a year, pretty much all the time. Then, on January 21st, 1985, a fellow employee named Roger Hurt, and I can mention this name because this happened a long time ago and you don't even know where it is or know him. His name is Roger Hurt. Uh, I witnessed to him and he actually showed some genuine interest in what I was, I gave him the simple gospel. And so after work, I invited him to my house for dinner. So he followed me home. We were up to midnight talking about the Bible and I led him to Jesus. Now, I don't think he was pretending either because the very next day at work during our lunch hour, uh, back then people didn't have cell phones. If you had to make a phone call, you had to go to pay phone. And we actually had a pay phone in our factory we worked at. And uh, I overheard this Roger talking to his girlfriend. Now, he was unaware that I was even hearing this conversation. And he was telling his girlfriend what he had did the night before about how he confessed to Jesus and all that stuff. And it was then I really knew that was a real thing because he wasn't ashamed to, to tell his girlfriend. Now, well, let's skip forward a little bit. February 4th, 1985. Heard some news that Roger was in jail. I never knew that. I, I didn't really get the details on it. I guess he got out because he was back to work a couple days later. Never found out. We never really talked a lot about it at work either. April 18th, 1985. Roger quit the job, so I didn't see him again. Now, jump ahead almost a whole year. March 11th, 1986, I heard that this Roger fellow, he had a punctured lung, and that he was living with his dad. And I heard that also that he had married his girlfriend, probably because he was living with her before, and he felt a conviction about fornication and all that. I think he wanted to make an honest woman out of her. I don't know details on that. But anyway, she was a drug addict also. And I guess she, they were on equally yoked basically, and I guess they were going to be getting a divorce, and that's why he was living with his dad. Okay, we're going to jump ahead a couple years now. September 27th, 1987. I was listening to the news on the radio one day. And I heard his name mentioned. He was murdered. He was in front of some apartment or something, sitting in his car, somebody walked up and just shot him in the head, graveyard dead. I'm really glad I witnessed him. I'm pretty sure he, he was really trying, and you know, I've seen this in this community too, here people that try to turn their life around and a tragic end comes. Some of you all know who I might be talking about. And also, you might be wondering, how do I know all these specific dates and stuff? I keep a prayer journal. I don't know if any of you ever done that before, but it's really a good idea. Whenever you have a prayer, write it down, when God answers it, how he answered it, and after a couple of years, you're going to have a big book thick of all the blessings and things God did for you. That way, later on in life, if you ever feel discouraged or depressed, just go back to your prayer journal and say, boy, God bailed me out of so much. So he's not going to forsake me now either. It's just something that encourages. And also, it's kind of good to leave behind for your great-great-grandkids. It's kind of a, a testimony. It's just a suggestion. For me, it's always working. I've got like 30 years worth of this stuff. That's how I know these dates. Now, sometimes when we share the simple gospel, 
part good news. <laughs> we need to share the bad news first sometimes. Like it says in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sometimes we do need to share the law, though. Like it says in 1 Timothy 1.8. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. See, the law was made for sinners. It was not made for righteous. And who's righteous? Well, those who put their trust in what Jesus did. You know, he bore our punishment for our sins, past, present, and future. Now, our sins actually were imputed to Jesus, and his righteousness was imputed to us. Now, that's actually kind of simple to remember. That's basically a simple gospel. Now, in Romans chapter 10, if any of you don't know this scripture, I doubt if you're even saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's it right there. That's really pretty simple, isn't it? I didn't have to add anything or take anything away from that either. Now, when we share the simple gospel, you need to keep this in mind, though. We're supposed to tell others the good news, but it's up to them to either accept it or reject it. It's their free will. Don't try to beat them over the head with the Bible. I've, heard, I've seen some Christians try to do that and actually turn people away. They get off track. They, they don't stay with the simple gospel. They start laying all the laws on them, and they actually turn people away. It's up to them to decide. You know, they're either going to get mad at you or they're going to accept it. And after you've done your job, you told them the simple gospel. And that's all there is to it. It's that simple. And that's it. Hope you got something out of it.